Hello, welcome back to physics. We're working constant acceleration motion problems, or motion with constant acceleration problems in physics. And the first problem goes like this. An airplane has a liftoff speed of 120 kilometers per hour. And then we have two questions. First part, if the plane needs 240 meters of runway to take off, what acceleration is needed? That's part A. Part B, how long in seconds are needed for takeoff? Now, this is a relatively easy problem in physics. It's not gonna become super hard to solve. You'll see, it's just one sheet of paper. We'll do it here. But if you're used to, in your math classes, being able to see exactly how to solve a problem in the very beginning, you need to kind of get rid of that idea in physics. It's going to be difficult, especially when we get to more difficult problems, for you to read it and just know exactly what to do. The way to handle physics problems, and you're going to have to trust me from years of experience teaching people and also struggling myself with some of this stuff a long time ago, is that you have to write down what you know. And then you have to draw a picture of what it is it's asking you, or the situation, and then write down any rele relevant equations. And then you start piecing together, well, I could find this. Well, I could find that. Maybe if I found that, I could find this. It's like a puzzle. It's like nobody sits down with a puzzle and solves it right away. You put pieces together, and then the puzzle then becomes apparent, what, what, has to, what it looks like, right? So that's what we're going to do here. The very first thing we're going to do here is we're going to write down the relevant equations. We've already talked about all of these equations before in detail. What I'm going to do for every problem is I'm going to write the equations down. That's going to do two things. It's going to teach you that you need to write the equations down with every problem you solve. And it's also going to let you help you memorize the equations because we're going to write them down every single time. And I've done this on my own exam on my own paper. Every time for every problem, I write down all of the relevant equations. There's only three of them for motion with constant acceleration. The first one we've already talked about, we've already talked about all of these. The displacement from your starting point, right, or the total displacement is the initial position uh, plus v naught t, the initial velocity times the time, plus one half times the acceleration times the time squared. We've already talked about what these terms mean in previous lessons. The next equation that's relevant is the final velocity of the motion is going to be equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. That's the second equation. And then the third equation is the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times x minus x naught. So basically, x minus x naught is the, dis the total displacement from the starting point. How far did I go after I subtracted the starting location? Most of the time, x naught is 0. Most of the time, both of these are 0. Uh, in fact, in this problem, we're going to find out that this is 0. So this is the displacement from the starting position. All right. So you need to write them all down. In fact, this third equation <clears throat> really comes from combining the first two equations together. But it, the third equation is really useful because it lets you find like the acceleration or the displacement or, or, or whatever when you don't know the time. You don't know how long it takes for the motion to happen. Notice there's no t anywhere in this equation. The first two equations have time. The third one does not. So if you ever have a problem, it doesn't give you any time information. It might be a, a case to use that third equation. Which equation you use just depends on what you have been given. So in order to go farther in that direction, we need to write down what we've been given. Now we read the problem and it says an airplane has a liftoff speed of 120 kilometers per hour. All right, and, the, and it tells you in part A the runway is 240 or it needs 240 meters of runway to take off. So right away that should tell you there's a problem. Because the speed, the velocity, is given as 120 kilometers per hour. Kilometers is not the unit we want to work in. We always want to work in meters. And we definitely don't want to work in something per hour. Hour is not the unit we want to work in. We want to work in seconds. Meters, seconds, and kilograms. If your problem doesn't have meters, seconds, there's no mass here, so there's no kilograms. But if there was a mass, it should be in kilograms. In this case, we have meters, and we have seconds, and we have kilometers, and we have hours. And that's just not going to work. We have to convert kilometers per hour to meters per second. That's the very, very first thing we're going to do. Even before I draw a picture, I know I'm going to have to convert that. Um, so let me do it. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down 120. The unit is kilometers per hour. So you write it as kilometers per hour. Now ultimately, we want to get to meters per second. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the kilometer part. I know that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. And I write it like this because kilometers cancel with kilometers. Now I have meters per hour if I were to do the multiplication. But I don't want hours, I want seconds. So I'm going to write that one hour is 60 minutes, because I just remembered that. And I also know, because now at this point, hours would cancel with hours. So if I stop here, I have meters per minute. But I don't want that. I know that one minute is also equal to 60 seconds, right? So that minutes cancels with minutes. And now, 
if I multiply 120 times 1,000, and then, of course, I have times 1 up here, but divide by 60, divide by 60, what I'm going to get is going to be 33.33 meters per second. So the problem could have been stated, an airplane has a liftoff speed of 33.33 meters per second. If the plane needs 240 meters runway to take off, what acceleration is needed? All right, obviously that would have been a simpler problem, and they try to trip you up by giving you the wrong units. So the first thing you should do is convert all your units to the proper units, and then the next step is we're gonna write down what we know. But we're not just gonna start writing numbers. We need to draw a picture so that we see what actually is happening here. So what we have here is a situation where, and you're gonna have to forgive me because I'm not an artist. You already know this by now. But here's a runway, right? So there's some kind of like dash line or something in the center of the runway. All right, so over on one end of the runway, there's an airplane. And yes, my airplane looks like a bullet. So it doesn't look like a real airplane. I don't have time to, to write an actual air, to draw an actual airplane shape. But to help you remember that, I'm going to write that this is a plane. In other words, an airplane. And it goes down the runway, and when it gets down to the end of the runway, it takes off. So now the airplane has finally achieved flight. Right? So it's lifted off. So the idea is the length of this runway that is required, it says right here, if the plane needs 240 meters runway, so then what you need to do is start writing down, okay, at this position was x is equal to zero. That was the initial position. Let's call it actually instead of x is equal to zero, we're going to call it x naught is equal to zero. Because anytime you see a naught underneath the variable, either t naught or x naught, or you could have whatever, v naught, it just means the velocity or the position or whatever at time zero. Because we have time zero when the plane starts rolling and then later on down the road, down the runway, it lifts off some other time t down the road. So we're going to label it and say that the initial position, x naught is zero. And then he goes down here. And then the final position, we don't put uh, like a like a f or anything for final. We just use the variable x. That implies when there's no naught here, it means it's the final position. 240 meters. So you see you've extracted that from the problem. The problem said if the plane needs 240 meters runway, you've extracted it and you've drawn a runway and from that information you've said that x naught is zero and x is 240. See, the problem could have said the initial position of the plane was zero meters. The final position of the plane at liftoff was 240 meters. But see, that would be babying you too much. It's not going to ever give you that. You need to read it and realize, well, x naught is this and this is x because that's when liftoff happens. And then we keep reading and it says, a liftoff speed, a plane needs a liftoff speed of, now we know, 33.33 meters per second. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the, what is the initial p velocity of the plane? We would call that what? V naught, because that's the initial velocity of the plane. Well, it's not rolling. It's got to be zero meters per second. So this is meters per second, and this is position in meters. So it goes down the runway, and we know now that the final velocity of the plane, just as it lifts off the ground, is V, we don't have any V naught because V naught is the beginning state. Here's the end state. And we all now know that it's 33.33 meters per second. All the units are the correct units. We've got the initial speed or velocity and position. We have the final velocity and position. Of course, the plane lifts off and keeps on flying, but our problem doesn't concern ourselves with what happens to the plane after it's gone. Our problem only concerns ourselves with what's happening as it drives down the runway or goes down the runway. So. That's why we don't care what's going on after it lifts off. So uh, if you really want to get explicit about it, you could even draw yourself an extra 240 meters kind of label here. It's already implied. It's already basically telling yourself it's 240 meters, but this you know, could help you. So anyway, we have a picture. And so now we need to, at this point, look at our equations and figure out, okay, what do we know, which this is what's given to us. This is all we know. And what do I have to work with as far as equations go? What I'm trying to find out is what acceleration is needed given this stuff. So I start looking at this and I start saying, okay, I'm going to look at this equation first. Can I find the acceleration? Well, there is an acceleration in here. I know x, that's the final position of the plane. I know x naught, that's the initial position of the plane. I know v naught, that's the initial velocity of the plane. And I want to find a. Everything looks great. Unfortunately, there's time in here. And it doesn't tell me anything about how long it takes the plane to actually go from here to here. I don't know how many seconds it is. So I don't think I can use that equation. Then I go here and say, well, there's an acceleration here. Maybe I can find it with this one. I know the final velocity of the plane. I know the initial. But again, this time is a problem. I don't know what it is, so I can't find A. So then I look at the third equation. 
I know the final uh, velocity of the plane. I know the initial velocity of the plane. The number two is just a number. I want to find this. And look at this. This is x and x naught. I know x naught. I know x. So for this equation, I know everything in here <clears throat> except for a. That means I can use that equation to solve for a. And it's difficult to figure out what to do unless you have it all written down. You have to have all of your variables, all of your equations, then you can figure out what makes the most sense. You cannot pick a path forward without writing that stuff down. So don't waste your time. So the first thing we're going to do is write the equation again. It's v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a x minus x naught. And then the next step we're just going to substitute in. The final velocity of the plane is 33.33 at liftoff. The initial velocity of the plane is zero. So we're going to write this down. It's going to be 33.33, um, it's going to be squared, equals, this is zero, that's its initial velocity squared, plus two, that's a number, a, that's what I'm trying to solve for. And here I have x minus x naught. x minus x naught means the final position minus the initial position. In other words, it's how far I traveled. So I know it's 240 meters. You see, because the initial position happened to be zero, in this problem, or I took it to be zero, and then I knew that the final position was 240. For some problems down the road, your initial position won't be at zero. So this term, this x minus x naught term, is simply saying it's two times the acceleration times how far you traveled. From your initial position, how far away did you go? That's why you're subtracting them, right? But in this case, it's just zero for the initial position, so your final is 240 and your initial is zero. So I suggest that you write it out all like this, and that way I know the initial position, I know the final position, I know all the velocities, and then I can <clears throat> move along. So 33.33, when you square it, ends up being 1110.89. This is gonna be zero, and then all of this stuff is gonna be what? Two times, this is just gonna be 240, right? So you're gonna get 480 times the acceleration A. How do you find A? You just take this and divide by 480, and what you get is 2.31. What are the units? Meters per second squared. How do you know the units are meters per second squared? Because you have all of your velocities in meters per second, and all of your positions in meters, and you know the unit of acceleration is distance per time squared, and since you're using those distances and those times, you know it's meters per second squared, so you circle the answer. That's the acceleration. So that means that when the plane starts, release, release the brakes at time zero, we need to accelerate at 2.31 meters per second per second. That's what acceleration is. That's how much speed I need to pick up every second in order to get to the end of the runway with this velocity. If I accelerate down the runway at less than this, like 2.1 or 1.7 or something, what will happen is I'll accelerate, but when I get to the end at 240 meters, I'm not going to be going quite fast enough to take off. That's what, that's what that means. If you're going with a higher acceleration, then that means when I get to the end of the runway here at 240, I'm going to be going faster than this. So that's what that means. Now the second part of the problem, part B, it says how long in seconds are needed uh, for this takeoff, right? So remember, it's now asking me how long in seconds, whereas Originally, I went to the problem statement to find out what equation to use, and I didn't know anything about time, because the problem doesn't give me time. So I did not use this equation, I did not use this equation, and I focused on this equation. But see, now I use this equation to find the acceleration, and that means that now I know what A is. So I can use this answer that I just found as its additional information that I now know. So now, when I go back to the problem statement, I can look at, let's say, this equation. I know the final velocity, I know the initial velocity, that was all given in the problem. But see, now I know the acceleration, because I just calculated it. So I can use, I know all three of these, and now the t that I calculate is going to be how long it takes for this motion to happen, from initial position to final position. Or in this case, since it's velocities, to go from initial velocity to final velocity at this acceleration, the t that you get is going to be how long it takes to get there. right? So in other words, I can use that second equation now whereas I couldn't before, but now I have an extra piece of information. So I say, this was part A, so we're going to do part B. V is equal to V naught plus AT. The final velocity was 33.33. Notice we're not squaring anything in this particular equation. Zero is the initial velocity. The acceleration, 2.31 meters per second squared, and then I'm multiplying by time. All right, 
So this is obviously zero, this is just multiplied, so how do I find t? I take this, I divide by this. So time is going to be equal to 14.43 um, seconds. You know it's seconds because your acceleration was meters per second squared, your velocity was meters per second, so your time has to be in the same time units, which is seconds. So this is the easiest way to get to the answer. But let's think a little bit more and try to squeeze as much learning as we can. What, what this is saying is that this motion from here to here, this acceleration actually takes 14.43 seconds to get from here to here. That's what that's saying. Now we use this equation to get there, but let's look above. We actually can do it a totally sec separate way. You're gonna find out in the, all of these problems, in most problems in physics, but especially in the motion problems, there's almost always more than one way to solve the problem. Almost always. So in this case, we use the second equation, but you can actually, if you wanted to, just use the first equation. Because you know the positions, you know the initial speed, right? And you know the acceleration. So again, by using, this is a more complicated equation, but I know everything except for the time. So let's do it again really quickly. It'll just take a second. We'll do it again. Uh, we can use first equation which is what? x is equal to x naught plus v naught t plus one half a times t squared. And let's plug in everything and see what we get. The final position, anytime you see a, an x without a naught, it means the final position was 240 meters. That was the end of the runway. The initial position was zero, that's where the plane started. The initial velocity was zero because the plane was parked at the end of the runway. Zero times time. I don't know what time is. I'm trying to find it. Okay, then I have one half. And the acceleration, I just calculated 2.31. I can use that in this problem. And then I have t squared. You see, I have everything plugged in except for t. And notice this is even simpler now because this is zero. Now zero times t, whatever it is, is also going to give you zero. So all you have here really is uh, one half times 2.31 times t squared. So let's multiply these together. One half times that gives you 1.16 times t squared. So notice it's t squared, not t, it's t squared. So then to find t squared, I just divide by this. So 240 divided by this means that t squared is going to be equal to 207.79. Now, I know that time squared is equal to that. So how do I then find time? How do I find time? Well, the opposite of a square is a square root, right? So if I take the square root of the left, I'll get t and a square root of the right, I'm going to get 14.41 seconds. I'm, going to, I'm not even going to circle it because we're just doing it another way. And you might say, well, wait a minute, it's 14.41 here, and this is 14.43, but the reason they're different is just rounding errors. That's all it is. It's because when we calculated the acceleration way up here, the acceleration that we used was based on squaring all this other stuff and dividing, so there's a little bit of truncation of rounding here, and then I use that in this equation here, and so it's very slight difference in decimal points. But you can see to the first decimal place, they're exactly the same answer. So these are equivalent of one another. In other words, there's no right way to solve these problems. There's no one way to solve them. There's always multiple ways to solve them. And so I'm showing you, and I'll do that periodically, I'll show you that you can get the same answer another way, just to show you that there's not just one simple way. The other thing I'll say is those of you that remember algebra know that when you square root, take the square root of both the sides of these, positive 14.41 is, is a solution when you take the square root, but also negative 14.41 also. So usually when you do a square root, you have to say plus or minus. Um, because if you have minus 14.41 and square it, you'll get exactly the same thing. So negative 14.41 technically is a solution to this. But what does negative time mean to you? What is negative time? Negative time in physics just means it's time before t0. So in other words, our plane started here at time zero rolling. So that equation is saying, well, the end of the road happened at 14.41 seconds, but also there's another solution at negative 14.41 seconds, which is even before the problem started. It's a, it's a nonsense answer is the bottom line. It's, it's mathematically, sometimes you might get more than one answer if you have a square somewhere and you have to take a square root, but you always have to look at the answers and see what makes physical sense. Positive time makes sense. Negative time isn't going to make sense for any of our problems. So you just throw it away, and that's why I didn't write it down here. All right, that's it. Make sure you can solve this problem yourself. We're going to be doing a lot more of these, giving you a lot of practice, but it's a good first problem to show you how to do motion with constant acceleration in physics.